Hello, business majors, and more specifically, supply chain management majors, and even more specifically, hello, Western Michigan University Integrated Supply Management majors, in other words, ISMers. I want to take this opportunity to answer a lot of questions that I'm getting from students regarding the economy, the job market, and the timing of it all. Let me begin by saying that uh, the supply chain degree in the ISM program that you're in is fairly recessionary proof as long as as long as you're job ready and usually you're not job ready until you get some professional work experience directly related to what you're majoring in and that's kind of the issue with COVID is uh, have you gotten the work experience you need to be job ready so let me begin by saying that in general a business majors best friend is a growing economy the reason that's important is because if the economy is growing the economy creates jobs and if it creates jobs companies and businesses and industry can justify budgets for entry-level managerial positions in other words jobs for college grads so the cool thing about the US economy is that in general it's an economic growth machine and job creation machine in general the US economy is very good at growing constantly over a very long period of time for example, for the most part, for over 30 years, the U.S. economy has grown every day from day to day, from week to week, from month to month, from year to year. Yes, for over a 30-year stretch. There have been cycles of a little shrinkage. For example, some of you might remember the Great Recession of 2008. That was very, very short-lived. But in general, when an economy shrinks, it creates fewer jobs. And in general, business majors that are graduating from college, it's all about timing. If you graduate, hit the job market when the economy is actually shrinking, you have fewer opportunities, especially if you're not job ready. Likewise, COVID hit in March of 2020, and we saw enormous amounts of shrinkage and economic growth in a very short amount of time. So we're back to life's all about timing. The cool thing is that you're majoring in something that's fairly recessionary proof, and I have data to prove that around the 2008 time frame, my students got job offers and they got jobs. They didn't just get as many job offers as they typically would have, but how many job offers do you actually need? Because you only need one good job and you can only take and accept one good job offer. So the 2008 recession was relatively mild for business grads in supply chain management. So I thought that was a telling sign. And then with COVID, my students that were job ready and had previous uh, professional work experience still did exceptionally well and are employed. Uh, and uh, that's because they were job ready. And because if you remember during COVID, the government came out and said anything and anything related to supply chain management will be regarded as an essential service. So it's kind of cool that you're majoring in something that during a pandemic, our government has actually said what you're majoring in is an essential service, not a bad way to go. And it wasn't probably until COVID that the term supply chain management was on TV and on the news and was being said every, what, five seconds, five minutes. And all of a sudden, everyone in the economy started to realize what supply chain management was because it worked and it worked very well. People got what they wanted and when they needed and they, for the most part, uh, got what they needed when they needed it. Uh, yeah, maybe for the first week they couldn't find any toilet paper, but by week two or three, they were able to get it. So uh, I wanna begin by saying, first of all, you're majoring in something that's fairly recessionary proof. You're doing so in a country that has an economy that typically grows every year, which creates jobs, which means that you're always gonna have those opportunities. And again, over the last 30 plus years, there's only been a couple of time periods where we've seen shrinkage in the economy that has translated into fewer opportunities for college grads. So I think between uh, 1991 and 2008, the economy grew basically every month. Then after the Great Recession of 2008, we saw a 10 plus year stretch of economic growth. And most industrialized nations can't say that they even have the ability to do this thing. So in general, because the US economy is a job creation machine, uh, you don't have much to worry about as long as you're job ready and you time it so that you hit the job market when it's not actually in shrinkage mode. And even if it is, if you are job ready and have the work experience to fall back on because you're majoring in something that in general industry demands all the time, uh, you'll be in good shape. Okay, I have students asking me, hey Shima, how does the job market look right now for ISM grads? Okay, let me begin by saying, 
have a group of students that are graduating right now in the spring of 2021. Most of them have full-time jobs lined up. The reason they have full-time jobs lined up is because last summer or the summer before or during the school year, they had internships with companies. In other words, they had professional work experience. In other words, they're job ready. And then those employers were so happy with those internship experiences with those students that they extended full-time offers to them upon graduation. So again, they got the work experience, they're job ready. Most of them are picking up full-time jobs with companies that they previously interned with. So those students are fine. Even with COVID, uh, they've been able to land full-time offers because companies are reloading in supply chain management and it's never been more important than because of and during COVID. I do have a group of students that are kind of at risk and I've sat down with most of them and those are the students that were juniors last year. In last year, March of 2020, a lot of students were going into COVID with summer internships lined up. Now here's the problem. For the summer internships during 2020, I would say half the companies reneged on those offers because of COVID, okay? The other half did not renege and provided our students with internships that they were committed to previously to COVID and the pandemic outbreak. Uh, most of those internships that weren't reneged on were virtual and were remote and tend to be data-driven. So it really required that our students have strong business analytics and data analytics skills in order for them to prosper and flourish. And we did have a small percentage of students that actually went face-to-face on-site with their internships. But again, around half of our students from last year that had internships lined up, they didn't get those internships because of COVID. So I've encouraged a lot of them. We've sat down, we've looked at their resume, we've looked at their professional work experience. We've tried to ask the question, are you job ready? And if you are job ready, hey, graduate and hit the job market because if you are, you'll still find a job even in this kind of economic environment that's still in the midst of the pandemic. But we had a lot of students that were going into their internships last summer that didn't get those internships and right now don't have any previous professional work experience to fall on and say that they're job ready because of. So I encouraged a lot of them to delay graduation by one semester. In other words, maybe not graduate April or May of 2021, but graduate December of 2021. And this summer, pick up an internship, ideally with a company that tends to flip full-time offers to their interns, so that when you graduate in December of 2021, you have a great full-time job waiting for you, mostly because now you are job ready because of that internship and that company had an opportunity to evaluate you uh, for the purposes of extending a full-time offer to you. So most of my students last year that thought they were graduating in spring of this year, those students that didn't get internships last year have delayed graduation until December of 2021. Most of them have actually landed internships for this summer, so it's kind of working out for them. Also, they've been able to spread out their course load over a wider number of semesters. Many of them have told me with a lighter course load, they picked up their GPAs a little bit. Most importantly, most of them have told me by delaying graduation for one semester and picking up that internship this summer, they picked up a minor, in particular the business analytics minor, and then they're more prepared for their internships and the huge amounts of data that are gonna be thrown at them. And then also upon graduation, they're gonna have a lot of the technology skills, which will make certain that they're never outsourced or replaced by the technology that they're actually gonna be using to do their jobs better, faster, and cheaper. So I say, if you're majoring in something that the government says is an essential service, that can survive a pandemic, that can survive COVID, you're probably majoring in something that in general is a safe bet. And that's what I see with supply chain management. So, so far, so good. Uh, it looks like I think most of the decision, the students that were impacted by not getting internships last summer uh, have made the right decision and are doing everything in their power to make sure that they're job ready. And that's how you get full-time offers. Okay, I've got more questions from students that I will address. Uh, some students are saying, hey, Shima, I'm not a junior. I'm not graduating in 2021. What if I'm one, two, or three years away from graduation? How does the job market look in your opinion? Uh, it's not my opinion. It's basically a bunch of experts converging on similar results regarding what they think the job market will look like moving forward. Uh, first of all, let me begin by saying that economic growth and recovery for the U.S. economy 
began in 2020. The shrinkage and the recession was very short-lived. The U.S. economy started growing like crazy in 2020. And predictions are for 2021 that the U.S. economy might grow 4, 5, 6%. Okay? Right now, in uh, April of 2021, we're still minus around 9 million jobs because of COVID. So there are 9 million people out there that lost their jobs because of COVID that haven't gotten their jobs back yet. Now, America has a workforce of around 130 million people. So we keep getting closer and closer to growing the economy and creating jobs at a rate that will put everyone back to work that lost their jobs because of COVID. If the U.S. economy grows at 4, 5, 6%, during 2021, in other words, that's the prediction by most economists. They think this is going to be a V-shaped recovery and it's already started to happen. If that's the case, all those people that lost their jobs because of COVID will get their jobs back sometime during 2021. So a lot of economists are saying, okay, the U.S. economy is gonna grow four, five, six percent during 2021. And then in 2022, they predict similar growth patterns in the U.S. economy, four, five, six percent. That means that at some point in 2022, unemployment will be at near record lows like we were pre-COVID. In other words, at four percent or slightly below in terms of unemployment, which is basically full employment in the United States, which means everyone that wants a job has a job and the U.S. economy is a job creation machine. Okay, so yes, if you're graduating in 2021, you have previous full-time work experience and are job ready, I think you're going to be fine in this job market. In 2021, we're going to see the economy grow 4, 5, 6%. That's a job creation machine, which will serve business majors in general very well. If you're graduating in 2022 or 2023, uh, you'll barely remember COVID in terms of its economic impact because it will be a job creation machine as long as you develop your soft skills and hard skills and minor in something that complements what you're majoring in and get professional work experience and are job ready. All indications are you have absolutely nothing to worry about. You rarely have anything to worry about even during downturns like the Great Recession and COVID because data indicates that what you're majoring in is fairly recessionary proof is again as long as you're job ready when you hit the job market. I had a student just ask me Hey, Shima, do you see anything potentially happening that would hurt us in the job market? And the answer is kind of yes, but I don't think it will happen. And here's what might happen. The U.S. government has taken it upon itself to basically pump $6 trillion into the U.S. economy to make COVID short-lived in terms of its economic impact. So think about that. The U.S. economy, when you add up all the dollar signs in one year and don't double count anything, America's GDP is around $22, $23 trillion. For the first time in American history, up to a quarter of the U.S. economy and GDP is going to be the U.S. government spending money and putting money in the hands of Americans. Okay. The good news about that is it's going to create a demand surge. There's tons of money out there. And during COVID, most people didn't lose their jobs and they still got their paychecks and they've been sitting on cash. The savings rate in America has skyrocketed. So during 2021, between the high savings rates, between the people that never lost their jobs and the people that are getting their jobs back, along with the government pumping $6 trillion into the U.S. economy, you're going to see the U.S. economy grow at 4, 5, 6% rates, which is an economic demand explosion, okay? Now you might think, well, doesn't that create jobs and put people to work? And the answer is yes, it does, but it also creates the potential for this thing called inflation, inflationary pressure. And once you have inflation, and it hits you and it's big, it puts the brakes on an economy and the engine stalls and it's hard to start it back up. So I kind of want to explain what the risk here is and what you should probably be paying attention to just a little bit. But I'll preface this by saying I don't think it's going to happen. Okay, so what's inflation and why is it bad and why is it so dangerous that it's actually freaking people out? Think about what's happening here. People have jobs. We're moving out of the pandemic. People are getting vaccinated. We're getting back to normal. 
People that have always had jobs, which is most Americans, they've been saving money, and now they're getting ready to spend lots of money, buy stuff, go places, travel, vacations, get another vehicle, that sort of thing. And a bunch of people that lost their jobs are now getting their jobs back, and they're making money, and now they wanna spend their money. And then the US government basically prints and spends and gives Americans $6 trillion worth of economic stimulus. So demand is going to surge. American industry is going to have to keep up with demand. If the demand surge combined with tightened supply lines, because we're just now getting out of the COVID situation, think about that. Supply lines in general in a global economy are still a little tight because some countries are just opening up for business. Uh, so things are tight there. Demand is surging. It's the perfect recipe for inflation. Inflation basically just means stuff's gonna cost more. If demand is huge and supply can't keep up with demand, prices are gonna go up, that's inflationary pressure. Now, inflation is bad because think about what that means, stuff costs more. Inflation means stuff costs more, which means our standard of living and quality of life lessens. Why? Because stuff costs more. You can't buy as much stuff with the same amount of money. And if you define quality of life and standard of living based on how much stuff you can afford to buy, then yeah, that's gonna impact our quality of life if we actually get the inflationary pressure. So the question becomes, if supply lines are a little tight because we're just pulling out of COVID and demand is through the roof because there's all this pent up demand and people have cash and they've saved and people are getting their jobs back and the US government is pumping $6 trillion into the economy, does inflation skyrocket? And I will say if inflation skyrockets very quickly overnight, the banks stop loaning out money to people. And that's where uh, most small to medium sized businesses and consumers get a lot of their resources and money from is banks and borrowing money. Combined with uh, if things cost more, people are less inclined to buy stuff. So companies crank out less stuff, which puts people out of work. So now you have potentially uh, higher prices for everything and people losing their jobs. So you don't want inflation and large amounts of it. You don't want it to happen overnight. So a lot of people are concerned that this is a risk that the US government is rolling the dice on, that by stimulating the economy this much, this fast, we create this situation where we might have inflationary pressure. So that's my only concern is, yeah, Inflation in America typically is around 2% a year. If we all of a sudden go to 3, 4, 5, 6% inflation, uh, trust me, that would be a bad thing for the US economy, the global economy, the job market. I don't care if you're graduating, have graduated, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7% inflation in an economy that's used to 2% inflation a year. Yeah, that would bring the economy to a standstill. It would crash and it would be a terrible situation. Okay, the US government is telling us that there's very, very little chance of the US economy experiencing huge amounts of inflationary pressure in a very short amount of time, okay? The reason they're saying that is one, they can slow the economy down if they sense there's inflation starting to creep up on us. You know, they can raise rates, they can slow the economy down. Also, these tightened supply lines in this global economy, they're gonna loosen up a little bit because the global economy is opening up because the pandemic hopefully is coming to an end. So in other words, the supply lines will allow for a greater supply in a shorter amount of time, which will also ease inflationary pressure. I think the X factor here that a lot of people aren't talking about is, okay, let's say the supply lines still get tight. Let's say uh, demand is still really high, supply is uh, relatively low. We forget that uh, the American workforce is the most productive in the world. Our rate of improvement in productivity is the highest in the industrialized world and our rates of improvement in productivity sometimes are as high of that as of underdeveloped and developing countries, which isn't supposed to happen because they're starting from a uh, lower uh, benchmark, if you will. So if you asked me, do you think there will be inflationary pressure? My answer is yes, but just a little bit, but not enough to crash the economy. Okay, and the reason I say that is because I do think the Federal Reserve Board kind of knows what to do. If they see inflationary pressure, they might slow the economy down just a little bit by increasing rates, and they have plenty of room to do so, combined with 
all of the supply chain professionals out there that are managing these really tight supply lines where they're having problems getting the things that they need, they will manage those things in a way where they're not as tight. And then also, I think Americans are just going to do things better, faster, and cheaper, which means we're going to have higher productivity uh, numbers, levels, and rates of improvement, which will offset any of the inflationary pressure that might come along. Uh, people don't talk about this, but one, again, America is the most productive workforce in the world. Our productivity in America tends to skyrocket when bad things happen to us. For example, the quarter after September 11th, after the terrorist attacks, American productivity skyrocketed. So September 11th happened, Americans didn't go home, hide in the corner, and call in sick for work. They did just the opposite. They went into work and they did things better, faster, and cheaper. And there's decades of, de decades of data that basically says Americans tend to rise to the occasion. So I think what's happened is during COVID, Americans have figured out how to do things better, faster, and cheaper uh, through remote working, virtual work experiences. Just think about companies now saying, hey, even after COVID, you're only going to come into the office half the time because it saves us money if you don't come into the office, if you don't have to. Just think about the energy cost savings, the productivity gains that would be associated with not commuting one to two hours daily, going to work and then coming back from work and maybe taking half of that time and give it back to the company by working. Just the ability of Americans to figure out how to do things better, faster and cheaper. I know for a fact that that is an outcome of COVID. So if you factor that into high demand and tightened supply lines, uh, I don't think the inflationary pressure will actually hit us to the point where it'll put the brakes down the economy and impact the job market for ISM grads. Okay, I'm going to try to finish up this conversation on inflation because uh, you're not econ majors, but you have to understand economics just enough to the extent that you're going to know how you're going to be impacted by the economy. So you want the economy to have a little inflation. Okay, so America in general has about 2% inflation a year. You want just a little inflationary pressure because a little inflationary pressure means prices do go up a little bit. And in general, the U.S. economy is all about people working and spending money. U.S. consumers, by spending money, are about 75% of the U.S. economy. So anything that gets in the way of people spending money like COVID or higher taxes uh, is bad for the U.S. economy and as a result bad for the global economy because Americans in general, when they spend their money, they're like 20% of Earth's economy. So if you want to buy something and prices go up a little bit each day, just a little bit, at some point you're going to buy what you want because you know if you wait, the prices are going to go up. So companies like a little inflationary pressure because it stimulates the U.S. consumer to actually buy stuff. And with a little inflationary pressure and prices going up, companies can make more money. A little inflationary pressure, when everyone's working and spends their money, is win-win. People spend money, which creates jobs, which puts people to work and helps companies make more money, so they reinvest in ways to make more money. So a little inflationary pressure is actually a very, very good thing. So what does a little inflationary pressure mean in general between 2 and 3% annually, okay? At the same time, you don't want high inflation. You don't want it to happen overnight because, again, that'll put uh, an economy uh, at a standstill and it's hard to start that engine back up again. The opposite of inflation is deflation. This has always been a concern over the last 30 years, even though it's never actually happened. That's when stuff actually starts to cost less and less and less. And you don't want that to happen either because if you're a consumer and you just see prices keep falling, you're going to wait and wait and wait until the price keeps falling before you buy something. And then no one's buying anything, so what do companies do? They stop making stuff. When they stop making stuff, they tell people that they lost their jobs. And then you were waiting to buy something at a lower price. Because everyone did that, your company just told you you lost your job because they're not making as much stuff anymore because no one's buying stuff. So deflation is very, very bad. We don't really have that. But the thing is, if you don't have inflation, that by definition means you have deflation. So it's the balancing act that is the responsibility of our government. And based on what I'm seeing, even though demand is surging, people have saved a lot of money, people are getting their jobs back, and even though the U.S. government has pumped $6 trillion into the U.S. economy, demand is exploding. We're looking at potentially 6% growth in the U.S. economy during 2021 and 2022. I think we can balance this out between the feds, 
interest rates, loosening up supply lines, and in particular American productivity, where we'll have a little bit of inflation, maybe a little more than we're used to, but not an amount that will put the economy to a crashing halt. Uh, and that's the balancing act. And apparently America is really good at this. Okay, I've got one more question before I wrap this stuff up. Uh, someone has asked me, hey, Shima, the government is printing money and spending money we don't have. Our national debt is now $27 trillion. That's actually more than our annual U.S. GDP. Should we be worried about that? <laughs> so you're basically asking me, we're spending money we don't have and we may never be able to pay that back should that be a concern for us. Well, if you spent money you don't have in your life and there was no way you were ever going to be able to pay all of your bills, would you personally be concerned? And the answer is yes. So should we as a country be concerned that now the U.S. government has $27 trillion in debt? Is that a big number? Well, that's bigger than our entire economy in one year. In other words, our debt is over 100% of our GDP. And under most circumstances, I would say that's a train wreck waiting to happen. If there's one country on the planet that could maybe get away with having more debt than its annual GDP, if you ask me which country could actually get away with this, yeah, I would say the United States, but I would also say, yeah, but that still doesn't mean that it's a good thing. But let me say this also. Uh, most companies out there that make money and that have positive cash flow, a lot of companies out there that are actually sitting on cash, they still have debt and they still borrow money because they want to invest uh, in their future so they can make even more money. And the cost of borrowing is so low that they've just decided that taking on the debt is worth it. So if there's a company out there that has positive cash flow, good margins, and is actually sitting on large amounts of cash, maybe they say that they want to find the next trillion dollar industry or they want to uh, triple their sales revenue over a period of time and they can't do that with their current cash flow and their current cash reserves. Why wouldn't they borrow money? So what I'm trying to say is you could, there are a lot of healthy companies out there, again, that have positive cash flow, that have cash reserves, that have assets, that still have debt and very, very large amounts of debt. Yeah, they're kind of rolling the dice, but the cost of borrowing is so low and they're so confident in their future and what they're going to do uh, with that debt that uh, banks gladly hand them the money. So is the U.S. government and the U.S. economy any different? I will say this. The U.S. government has assets. The government at the federal level alone, don't quote me on this, but probably owns one third of all of the real estate in square miles in the United States. The U.S. government owns stuff and has assets like land and weapons that are worth something and have dollar signs associated with it. And the U.S. government has cash flow coming in. It's called tax revenue. Yeah, right now they're spending more money than they're bringing in, but there are companies out there that do the same thing because they think they're investing in their future. So in situations like COVID, you can make the case that they had no choice but to print money and spend money that they didn't have. I don't like it, and I don't think we should have that much debt, but if we invest it in a way that generates more tax revenue long term by doing things like uh, creating jobs, then maybe it will pay for itself, but we all know that the government wastes a lot of money, so we know a lot of the money that it spends uh, doesn't generate a return on investment. So I think that's the bigger part of the problem is not necessarily them spending money, but what they're spending money on. I kind of like spending money on the right kind of infrastructure because I think when you spend money on infrastructure, it helps the American workforce do things better, faster, and cheaper. So that stuff tends to pay for itself. So uh, not a huge fan of our national debt, but I'm not freaking out about it right now. The issue is that if this spending and these investments don't pay for themselves and generate a return on investment like additional tax revenue, and that becomes problematic because at some point, everyone, including the U.S. government, has to pay its bills. So I think potentially what could happen is if our debt gets too large, they're going to have to raise taxes. If our debt gets too large, they're going to have to tell people that the benefits that they paid into, they might not get back what they paid into it. So, for example, if you've been paying into Social Security your entire life, the government might say, we can't pay you back what you paid into it because we don't have the money which would kind of suck because you're like, wait a second, so I'm only going to get half of that back. You might have paid into uh, retirement health care like Medicare, 
and then they tell you yeah you thought you were going to get free health care when you were a senior citizen you have to pay for half of this out of pocket yourself right now so i think if the debt gets bad enough and if these investments weren't good ones and they don't pay for themselves what's going to happen is you have a bunch of old people that won't get back what they paid into with their benefits like social security and health insurance for those of you that are in your 20s what might happen is when the u.s government has to start paying its bills they might just have to say i have to raise your taxes and you thought you were going to give the government 30 percent of your paycheck maybe the government will take half so I do see debt being an issue. I don't know if it's an issue right now, but at these rates, if they continue, what could happen is you could be working and for the better part of your career, the government could be taking more money out of your paycheck than you ever imagined and that previous generations have seen. I've spent my entire professional career where the government takes about 30% of my paycheck. I got used to it and I think that's normal. Maybe you're gonna be a part of that generation where it's gonna be 40 or 50% because the government simply spent money that it didn't have and those investments didn't pay for themselves. So again, in general, work hard, you'll be fine. You're definitely majoring in the right thing. And I think the US economy moving forward is going to be fine. It's gonna be a job creation machine. Right now, the US economy is growing so much so fast and so much faster than any other place in the world outside of China that so much money from outside of the United States is coming to the United States because they want to invest in that growth. That is really bad news for uh, poorer countries because they're really struggling with COVID and what wealth they do have in their countries because their economies aren't growing, that wealth is coming to the United States. So again, I think as long as the United States economy is a source of global investment, maybe we can do crazy things like have 27 trillion in debt, which is more than the size of our economy, and have the government spend $6 trillion over a 20 month time period to pull out of uh, the COVID pandemic. Okay, that's a wrap. Uh, if you have any more questions, uh, let me know and I'll do my best to answer.